Chapter 10 It was true. They had gone on a double date, and all four participants had survived. Derek counted it as a minor miracle. Maybe it should be upgraded to major miracle. Roger and Henny had been making eyes at each other all morning. He didn't know exactly what had happened, but apparently the two had connected over the ravioli. Minnie thought it was because they'd had too much wine. Merle thought it was because she'd lent Henny some of her special perfume. She swore it was a man magnet, and that's why she could no longer wear it herself any more. As much as he liked Merle, Derek seriously doubted that theory. Jill and Lonnie appeared on the outs. Not that Lonnie was giving up. Not by a long shot. She says she's not into me, Lonnie frowned. Yet I was getting signals all night that she thought I was the man. Hey, you should listen to your gut, Bob advised as he snatched a donut. Hey, intuition, man. Hey, it'll never leave you wrong. Lonnie nodded. I'm going to pull out all the stops. I've hired her band. I've got an enormous chocolate heart made. I'm going to win her. Wow, Derek commented as he filled his mug with coffee. She's really something special. She is, Lonnie agreed. The big show is going to happen just before lunch in the copy room. I'll sweep her off her feet. Good luck. Derek took his coffee and went to his desk to work. He was still tired after last night. He'd stayed up way too late, bonding with his roommates. Derek stifled a yawn. Rough night, Nelson asked as he gave Derek a small stack of files. Yes, Derek didn't choose to elaborate. The evening had been okay. He'd actually enjoyed it, playing games and just hanging out. Too bad it had been preceded by putting his dad back in jail. What's up? Nelson hesitated. Our boss is a little different. Oh? Derek thought it was a little funny that Nelson had just noticed this. What'd she do? She keeps trying to get me to open my briefcase. Nelson shoved his glasses up. Once, when I went to the copy room, I returned early because she'd forgotten a file and was trying to unlock it. Really? Derek blinked in surprise. He looked at Nelson, who had the briefcase in hand even now. He was surprised the guy hadn't handcuffed himself to it. That is odd. She's really great to work with otherwise, but that... I don't know. Nelson frowned. A man has a right to privacy, even at work. That's true, Derek agreed. He'd have to have a talk with Cynthia about this. As much as they both wanted to find out what was in the briefcase, it wouldn't do to get Nelson too worked up about it. She was going to have to be much more subtle in the future with her campaign to open the case. A briefcase should be off limits. I knew you'd agree with me, Nelson said, relieved. Would you mind talking to her about it? I'll do that, Derek answered. Don't worry about it, Nelson. It's taken care of. You're a great guy. Nelson nodded, and taking his briefcase, he left to go back to his work area. Man, Derek wanted to know more than ever what was in that case. Everyone began filing out about twenty minutes to lunch. Derek leaned back in his chair and snagged Minnie on the way out. Hey, Minnie! Derek, she came over to him impatiently. Can this wait? I want to go see the show. Are you sure you should? If everyone off the floor leaves, the senior staff are bound to notice, Derek cautioned. He didn't want anyone to get in trouble for leaving early. Everyone's going, Minnie shrugged. What are they going to do? Fire us all? Good point. Derek got up. However, maybe we should make sure our group comes back from lunch a little early so no one gets upset. I suppose... If we have to, Minnie grumbled. I think we should. Derek followed along with the crowd. Where's everyone going? To the copy room to see the disaster Lonnie's been bragging about, Minnie informed him. It'll be interesting to see the look on poor Jill's face once she sees what he does. Poor Jill? Derek raised an eyebrow. She'd gone from second most disliked woman in the firm to poor Jill now? Well... We all feel bad for her now that we pushed Lonnie on her, Minnie remarked. No one really deserves that. True, Derek had to agree. What's going on? Cynthia joined them. Nothing, Minnie quickly replied. Cynthia gave her an incredulous look. 
There's a mass exodus for the elevators and stairs. I didn't hear the fire alarm go off. Word has it there's going to be a meeting in the copy room for junior staff, Derek said smoothly. Your eye twitched, Cynthia accused him. There's more to this than what you're telling me. Wow, you two are in sync or something, Minnie eyed them both. Derek sighed. Just come along and enjoy the show. You're not going to tell me what this is about? Cynthia asked. Nope, it's a surprise. Derek hustled both of the ladies into the next elevator. They squished in amongst others who wanted to see the odd event versus those who just wanted to use the elevator to get where they were going. Once on the copy room floor, everyone started for the copy room. Derek frowned. It was going to be more crowded than he thought. Apparently, word had traveled fast in the company because people from other floors were turning up as well. Do I hear music? Cynthia tilted her head in puzzlement. It's a band, Minnie said excitedly. He's really going to do it. Do what? Cynthia looked at them in surprise. Sure enough, there was Lonnie holding onto a huge chocolate heart and flowers, a mariachi band of three singing old love songs, and Jill glaring daggers. Lonnie was exclaiming his love to Jill. She stomped over, grabbed the ginormous heart out of his arms, threw it on the floor and crushed it beneath her feet. She then took the flowers and pummeled Lonnie with them. What a waste of good chocolate, Minnie huffed. Wow, Cynthia stared in amazement at the petals flying through the air. Lonnie held up his hands to ineffectually defend himself. Jill marched to the band, said something rude, and exited the room to her inner office. Everyone in the room quieted, including the band. Lonnie looked down at the carnage of his Valentine's gift. You know, I think you were all wrong. I don't think she likes me at all. There were sympathetic remarks around the room. Lonnie held up his hands for silence. That's okay. Just means there's more of me to spread to the ladies. This man is not off the market. Who wants me? The women in the room made a beeline for the door as Lonnie grinned at them. I think we should get going, don't you? Minnie questioned. Absolutely, Cynthia agreed. Is it just me, or is he a little creepy? Very creepy, Minnie confirmed. Operation Jill and Lonnie was officially a bust, but it had been fun for a while, Derek reflected. He escorted Minnie and Cynthia back to the office. Minnie went to get her purse for a quick lunch, while Derek and Cynthia lingered near her office. What was that all about? Cynthia was a little confused. I'll tell you all about it later, Derek promised. His eye caught sight of something. Where's Nelson? He went for lunch. Why? Cynthia frowned and looked to see what Derek was staring at. The briefcase was on Nelson's desk, wide open. He left his briefcase? Open? Derek couldn't believe it. Do you think it's a trap? Cynthia grabbed Derek's arm. A trap? Derek scoffed. It's just a briefcase. They edged closer and peeked inside. There was a large silver frame with a photo in it. Do you think there's a secret message inside the frame? Cynthia guessed in a hushed voice. I think it's a picture. Derek lifted out the heavy frame, turning it upright. It was a picture of a much younger Nelson with his bride on their wedding day. Cynthia felt around the bottom of the briefcase. There's nothing else in here. All he had was a lousy picture. Unless he removed whatever was important. Ha! Ah, Nelson ran forward to confront them. Snooping in my personal belongings. Cynthia jumped and grabbed Derek again. Derek could understand why. Even as Nelson pushed up his glasses, his hair had become a little fly away from the quick jog, and he looked more frazzled than usual. We're sorry? Derek handed Nelson the frame. But why all the secrecy about a simple picture? It wasn't secrecy, Nelson calmed down, looking down at the photo with obvious affection. I just like having her close to me. Dude, you need to reconcile with your wife, Derek said kindly. It's almost Valentine's Day. Do something romantic to get her back. Nelson shook his head sadly. We're still on the outs over the cooking situation. Let her cook her meals for herself, Derek shrugged. 
There are meal services all over the city that cater to keto or low sodium or low fat. Ask around. She can cook for one and the other person gets a meal service. Or maybe if she prefers, she doesn't cook at all. Isn't it worth spending a little money on a meal service if it saves your marriage? I never thought of that. You're right. Nelson brightened considerably and shoved his glasses up. You do understand that I can't keep working here anymore. There's no privacy. We understand. Derek held out a hand. No hard feelings? None. Nelson gave each of them a handshake, grabbed his briefcase, and left. Now you have to hire me another PA, Cynthia said mildly. Crud. Derek thought about the list of applicants. None of them had been as good as Nelson. He'd have to call the agencies again. Cynthia gave him a sympathetic pat on the arm before heading into her office. Derek was surprised that Cynthia restrained herself from immediately asking how the hearing had gone. He counted down the time, betting with himself for when she would crack. Despite how busy they were interviewing clients, they did have a few moments uninterrupted together, yet she didn't display the slightest curiosity. Part of him was proud of her. The other part wondered what was wrong with her. Then again, it had been a busy day with Lonnie and Nelson's situations. It was after work when they were pulling into the parking lot to pick up the kids that she finally mentioned it. How did yesterday go? she asked. Fine. Derek didn't elaborate. Is he staying in prison? Cynthia pocketed her keys after locking the van. Yep, he responded. That's good. Cynthia decided not to push him for any more details. How's the costume coming? Derek asked as they walked into the school lobby to gather the kids. He thought it would be a good idea to direct her attention elsewhere. He didn't want to answer any questions about his dad. Cynthia surprised him, and herself, when she slipped her arm through his. Costume? You mean the bird? It's coming great. I'm asking because I thought you might have worked on it last night. He'd been surprised when she'd left him alone to get the clover case situated. Usually, she liked to ride him when deadlines were looming. He'd still done a little work on it after he got done playing video games with his roommates. I did, she said. It wasn't a total lie. She'd taken Sarah for a fitting and paid an exorbitant amount for a down payment on the seamstress's service. Did you get any sewing done? he asked innocently. Well, we cut material up against those paper form things. Cynthia knew enough that that was generally how things started. She also had a sneaking suspicion that Derek was trying to catch her out in her lie. There was lots of pin things to, you know, pin. Did you use the bobbins? Derek questioned seriously. There it was. The trap. She had no idea what a bobbin was and if it should be used at that stage in the project. Cynthia could admit she'd have been had or give it a 50-50 shot of getting it right. She took a deep breath. Not yet. Everyone knows you don't use the bobbins until later. When? When do you use them? Derek's mouth was twitching, and Cynthia knew he was amused. Okay, she rolled her eyes. What is a bobbin? I'll tell you if you admit to how you're really getting this costume done, he grinned. I'm paying someone. It would have be been better than me doing it, trust me. I should have just ordered one online, but no one would guarantee that it would arrive on time, Cynthia complained. She gave him a suspicious look. What is a bobbin? It's a piece that gets thread wrapped around it. It gets inserted in the bottom of the machine, he hurried to add. Before you ask, no, I do not sew. I just had a foster mom who was teaching the girls, and I happened to overhear that particular bit. I have no idea how it even works. Was it Louisa? Cynthia asked. Derek abruptly stopped walking. What? Cynthia winced. She hadn't meant to let him know that she'd researched him. Thanks to her stupidity, she'd let the cat out of the bag. Derek looked at her in disappointment, lead settling into his gut. You know. Yes, she admitted. I asked you not to delve into this. I asked you not to go there into my personal life. He pulled his arm away from her. His voice rang with anger and despair. I asked, and you just couldn't do it. I care about you, and I wanted to know, Cynthia protested a little defensively. No, if you cared, you would have respected my wishes. Derek ran a hand through his hair. You would have waited for me to tell you. 
if I chose to. Derek. She reached out to try to put a hand on his arm, but he pulled away. How can you even look at me? He let out a bitter laugh. I have trouble looking at me sometimes. You didn't do anything, Cynthia frowned. You were just a kid. I need to go, Derek muttered. Why? I don't understand. She stepped in front of him. Talk to me. Sin, you need to back off. I need space right now. His voice shook. I'm too angry right now to talk to you, so I'm just going to walk away. Don't wait for me. Tarek, maybe I can help, she offered. Maybe if you talked about it, you would feel better. Talk about it? He rubbed his eyes. I want to pretend that it never happened. If I could erase the first third of my life, I would. There's no one that can help. Cynthia wanted to argue with him, to tell him that she could at the very least try to comfort him. However, he walked away, and she didn't think she should follow him. She'd messed up badly. It was who she was. Cynthia knew she was rough around the edges. It came from competing with men for the top spot all the time. She needed to be quicker, smarter, harder, all to try to get in the same job. Those same characteristics had made her solve her curiosity about Derek, even though she had known he didn't want her delving into his past. Yet she'd done it anyways. It hurt that she'd hurt him. Cynthia swallowed past the lump in her throat as Sarah bounded up to her. "'Hi, Auntie Cynthia,' she said in her happy little girl voice. "'Where's Derek?' "'He's away today. He'll be back tomorrow,' Cynthia responded. "'At least she hoped so. She had never made Derek that angry before.' Cynthia took Sarah's hand and asked her about her day. Derek walked. He walked until he was so tired he had to hail a taxi to get home. He had no idea what neighborhood he ended up in, and he was probably lucky that he hadn't gotten mugged by the time he'd walked his anger off. He put himself under the hot spray of the shower with his aching feet, and just felt empty. He loved her, but why did she have to be such a pain in the neck? Wait, what? Derek opened his eyes abruptly, realizing that the water had gone cold and he'd been half asleep leaning against the shower wall. There was no way he loved that woman. She was impulsive, arrogant, irritating, annoying. She had no sense of privacy or of boundaries. She was demanding and selfish. She was beautiful. She was trying with the kids, even though she admitted she was out of her league there. She said she cared about him. She kissed like no other. Then again, he'd been through a long dry spell. Very long. Derek groaned and shut off the freezing water. He toweled off, somewhat dressed, and fell into bed. He'd gone insane. That was the only answer. It was insanity to fall for a dragon. Valentine's Day was coming up. Did he get her something? Did he not? It wasn't like they had a conventional relationship. He didn't even know what to call this thing between them. Well, she wasn't getting anything from him. He was mad at her. He intended to stay mad at her for a long while, he thought as he drifted off to sleep. Derek wasn't into work. It was five past seven in the morning, and he hadn't shown. Cynthia checked her Fitbit against her cell phone against her laptop to see if they were correct. Then she googled the time just to check again to see if they were right. They were. She looked over the farm of cubicles. Pete's paralegal was working diligently. Cynthia didn't know his name. You, what is the time? It's Lonnie time, he grinned up at her with his crooked teeth in need of a brushing. Whatever you want it to be, it's a good time, too. Cynthia blinked. No wonder Pete liked this guy. There are two peas in a pod. You do realize we have a strict policy on sexual relations in the workplace? Like how they aren't supposed to happen at all? Lonnie snorted. Come on. You're not that type of girl. We all know what you've been doing behind closed doors. Or should I say, who you've been doing? Excuse me? Cynthia could not have heard him correctly. Lonnie must not have heard the venom in her voice, or he was stupid enough to ignore it. We all know you're doing, Kramer. No other guy would allow himself to be dominated by a woman, unless he's dominating her in the bedroom. It's the main reason why you didn't get senior partner, besides the fact that you're a woman. Cynthia didn't bother to pardon herself as she walked away from him. Marching back to her office, she tried to ignore his words. 
yet it rankled. The senior partners had chosen Jameson over her, even though she was a far better lawyer than him. She brought in more income to the firm than he did. There were constant rumors he was involved with the young female interns. It made him a lawsuit waiting to happen. She managed to work for a little less than an hour before checking the farm again. Derek wasn't in his cubicle. Cynthia tried not to worry. He would be back, wouldn't leave her stranded no matter how much he hated his job, and was mad at her. She was pretty certain of that. At least, she was kind of sure? Maybe. Cynthia wandered over to the boardroom where she could hear voices. Funny, there was no one in the room. She entered, shutting the door behind her. Sure enough, she could hear her uncle speaking clearly. Jameson replied. Cynthia scowled as she approached the conference phone at the large table. Someone had left the line open. Probably Jameson had been in the conference room and was called over to her uncle's office. Jameson was clueless when it came how to operate a regular phone. He didn't seem all that confident with a regular cell phone either. She was about to end the call when she heard Derek speak. You wanted to see me, sir? I understand you've been working for Cynthia for eight years now, Mr. Stone Sr. said. That's correct, Derek responded. How would you like a bump in position? her uncle asked. I don't know what you mean. Derek's voice was careful. He means that since I'm about to make senior partner, I could use a better paralegal than Bob. Jameson laughed heartily. Let's face it, Bob's just not making the cut, and we've seen how you've been propping Cynthia up. You've been carrying her long enough. It's time you got better pay, better hours, and a better boss. Derek took a moment to respond. Excuse me? Are you saying you want me to work for you? That's right. Cynthia could practically hear Jameson smiling his arrogant smile. It's time for you to come work with a real boss instead of a skirt. Was her uncle going to let Jameson talk about her like that? Cynthia clicked her mouth shut and glared at the phone. What happens to Miss Stone? Derek asked slowly. Cynthia has tried, but we all know she hasn't been the best fit for the firm, her uncle said. At the end of the month, we are going to make some budgetary cuts that will include Mr. Hudson and Ms. Stone. They were going to fire her. How dare they? Cynthia stuffed a hand in her mouth before she said something nasty to the phone, giving her away. I suppose Ms. Stone would have no need for a paralegal at the end of the month, Derek said quietly. Too quietly. Cynthia had heard that tone before. She leaned forward in anticipation. That's right. Here's your opportunity to work your way up with me, Jameson laughed. She could imagine him slapping Derek on the back. I'd rather not, Derek stated mildly. Excuse me? Jameson was surprised. I said I'd rather not. Derek raised the volume like Jameson was hearing impaired. Thank you for the offer, but I'll stick with Miss Stone. Mr. Stone, I don't know how Jameson here has managed to convince you of his worth, which I assure you is negligible, but you're making a huge mistake. Cynthia makes more billable hours than any other lawyer in this firm. She constantly brings in business and income. She has a near-perfect winning record in court. If you let her go, you're about to hurt the firm's bottom line. Some other firm will snap her up, and I'll go with her. She should have been made senior partner. It's your loss, not hers. I'm sorry you feel that way, her uncle responded. I expect you to keep this conversation confidential. Why, so you can ambush her at the end of the month? I have more loyalty to her than that. I'm just sorry I have to be the one to burst her bubble of her faith in you, Derek said coldly. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen. She could hear Derek leave. I told you he wouldn't go for it. He's too deep into her panties, Jameson said in disgust. Disgusted herself, Cynthia leaned into the phone. Hey, I guess Mr. Kramer doesn't need to tell me what happened since I heard it all right here in the conference room. Next time, you might want to learn how to properly hang up a phone, Jameson. She ended the call. Jerks. Marching to Derek's cubicle, she leaned over the side. My office. He grabbed a set of files and followed her. You're late. Cynthia leaned against her desk, folding her arms as she watched him close the door. No, Derek elongated the word as he dropped the files on her desk. 
I stopped by the coffee room for the clover files. Before that, I was at the courthouse filing the paperwork for the Underhill case. I already dropped off the dry cleaning, ordered the cake for Sarah's birthday party, and got you the Wednesday German eclair. He put the pastry bag on her desk. Where's my latte? Cynthia toyed with the bag. It's Wednesday. That means you get cinnamon tea from the gourmet service that comes in the firm at nine. Derek checked his watch. I have five minutes yet before I need to go downstairs to get that for you. You're not getting that for me. She stated firmly as she put the treat bag back on the desk. Excuse me? Derek frowned. Until I get your new PA, I'm back to fetch and carry. I want to apologize for the other day. You're right, she admitted, ignoring his fetch and carry remark. I was totally out of line. I didn't respect your wishes, and I shouldn't have pried into your life without your permission. I'm sorry. Thank you, he said stiffly. And I don't look down on you for your past. Cynthia walked forward until she could straighten out his tie. She took her time. If anything, I admire you more for it. You've overcome a lot to get where you are, and I think that's amazing. He sighed. Cynthia. Stop. She put a finger to his lips in warning. Just take it for the compliment I mean it to be. He took her hand away from his mouth. I need to tell you something. What? Cynthia tilted her head back to study him. That my uncle is about to kick me out of the firm? That they tried to hire you for Jameson behind my back? Yeah. Wait, what? Derek looked at her in surprise. How did you know? Cynthia smiled. Jameson isn't exactly Mr. Technology. He left the phone in the conference room going. I heard the whole conversation. Thank you, by the way, for defending me. For choosing to stay with me. Jarek shrugged. After eight years of working together, I think we do okay. Yet you're not happy, she pointed out. What do you mean? Derek frowned. You're not happy. You haven't been happy for years working here. Cynthia smiled as she saw a little closer. I like to think it's not me, but my workaholic ways probably didn't help. It's not a big deal. Derek didn't back away. They're both losing their jobs by the end of the month, so who cared what anyone in the office happened to see? What would you do if you could work anywhere? Do anything? She asked thoughtfully. I'm not sure. Derek paused as an idea came to him. I'd like to work for a little non-profit that I keep funding, but I know they can't often afford lawyers and paralegal services. What do they do? She straightened his collar and pretended to brush imaginary lint off his shoulders. They help kids who've gone through similar situations as mine, he clarified quietly. Therapy, activities, meeting other kids, just helping. Often they look into the legal ramifications of extended family or other potential people to take custody of these kids to give them a chance at having a home life that is somewhat normal. You've given financially to them? Cynthia asked. Mostly. Sometimes I give the older kids a talk, let them know that they can have a future if they want. Derek placed his hands along her waist. Sometimes I give them free legal advice. When? I keep you pretty busy, she frowned. Not as often as I'd like, Derek shrugged. However, I guess we're about to be unemployed, unless you pick up something right away. I was thinking about taking a break, maybe, Cynthia confided in him, trying to figure out this mom thing. Not that I don't want to work, just fewer hours. Normal hours, I suppose, for most people. Now that sounds good, Derek admitted. I miss that thing called sleep. Maybe we could both get jobs at that organization of yours, she ventured with a shrug. It could work, as long as we can work around the kid's school schedule. Derek shook his head. I can't afford you, Sin. I doubt I could get a job with them. They aren't going to pay much. Although I only rent a room, it's expensive enough. Then don't rent, Cynthia smiled. Move in with me. I can't, Derek said reluctantly. Why not? Cynthia frowned, feeling a pang of disappointment. She'd been getting such good signals from him again. You're supposed to be giving the kids example. I'm not going to be some random guy living with you, Derek frowned and returned. You're not some random guy, she insisted. I was thinking we could define this thing between us. Maybe call it a relationship if you'd ever asked me out on a date. It's still too much to have your barely boyfriend sleeping over, let alone living with you. Think of what the kids will think. Derek pushed back. Boyfriend? Cynthia smiled at the idea. The kids love you. You feed them. 
It's high on their list of priorities. Derek smiled despite himself at her little joke and leaned his head against hers. I'm not moving in. Not yet. When? she asked. When we put rings on, which could be a year from now, two years, or maybe never. Derek pulled her gently against him. It takes time to figure out if this will be what we both want. Actually, Cynthia slid her arms to loop around her neck. She was surprised that he could be so old-fashioned about moving in with her. She kind of liked it. I've already decided what I want. I think if you're smart, you'll want the same thing. And what is that? He murmured. To be my valentine. She smiled up at him. That I might manage. He kissed her. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look forward to the epilogue of Sweet Valentine. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. You can purchase Sweet Valentine and other books by Josephine Bintema on Amazon. There's ebooks, paperbacks, and there's also available on Kindle Unlimited. Happy reading!